Hi, this is Nanveen Rana here at Hub Culture in Davos, and I'm joined by David Schreier from Imperial College. Welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. It's the very first morning of Davos, and Davos 24 is, sorry, Davos 2024 is really about rebuilding trust, but you're here talking about building trust in the first place. Yeah, well, it's, it's rebuilding trust in our institutions, our institutions of government and business, and so part of that is is. You know, building trust in some of the new things that we are bringing into the world. And in particular, AI. I spend a lot of time on artificial intelligence, yeah. So how do you go about building trust in AI when a lot of people are very worried about where it leads? It's an issue that we all have to come together around. So we are working on a multilateral effort called the Trusted AI Alliance to try and bring together thousands of AI researchers with government, with industry, entrepreneurs, civil advocacy groups. We need to bring everyone together to construct this new AI society because at the moment we have something called regulatory capture. There are a very small number of private interests, primarily corporate interests, who have taken over the process mm -hmm. of what rules are being written, what laws are being written, how we allocate money to support AI, what happens with our jobs. Right now, a very, very small number of people are making those decisions for us, and we are pushing rather urgently for a more open process. And what are your fears? I mean, what could go wrong with AI if it isn't regulated, if there isn't this sort of community of trust around it? Well, I, so I was speaking over the weekend uh, with one of the researchers who created transformers. So ChatGPT and BARD, all these large language models run on something known as transformers. It's a particular kind of, ah. of AI technology. Uh, and he was saying, you know, imagine a world in which Google or Microsoft took their business model that they used for advertising, for search, and they applied it to AI. This is a very real risk that could happen very soon. Yeah. And, and so think about it. They, Google will sell clicks. They'll decide, you know, something goes up the search results if it is basically someone buys more clicks, if they pay to be higher in the results. Uh, well, what if they did that with tokens? What if the answers you got from the language model were not based on what the best answer is, but rather who paid the most to give you an answer? Uh -huh. And that's just one example. Another example, which is even more profound, is that... Uh, um, corporations have this irresistible way to grow earnings by replacing people with AI. So about six months ago, the CEO of BT got in front of the press and he very proudly said he's going to replace 42% of his workforce with AI over the next seven years, 55,000 jobs, and he is not alone. We are seeing tens of thousands of layoffs in big tech because guess what? Software engineering, financial economists, analysts, logistics, a lot of these high-value jobs that we encouraged people to go get in the 90s and aughts are now vulnerable to AI disruption. So the IMF just came out with a report yesterday which aligns very well with the report I, I worked on with Evercore ISI which says 30 to 40 percent of the global employment will be impacted by AI. I mean, that's huge. How do you begin to prepare for that kind of a shock? And, and shock is a good word for it. So consider this. When we raised the retirement age in Paris, France, or uh, the whole country of France, from 62 to 64, there were riots in the streets. People were turning over cars and lighting them on fire. That's just by the slight adjustment to the retirement age. Mm. What's going to happen if we have a third of the world suddenly unemployed. And that could happen in the next five to 10 years. So we, we are on the edge of societal chaos if we don't regulate or monitor or manage this change a little different. And on the other hand, AI can do all sorts of wonderful things that we are just now beginning to harness. Well, before we <coughs> sort of work out how you manage that change, yeah. uh, just give us a sense of sort of the best of AI. You know, what, what is the great promise that AI brings? So uh, I'm involved with a, with a number of interesting projects around this, and, and the, the big picture is we finally can begin to realize the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, with AI's help. And so, for example, we can fix the climate crisis, we can figure out a way to feed the hungry, we can cure cancer and other serious medical conditions. All of this is now becoming possible thanks to AI. 
That's incredible. I mean, you know, clearly used well, this could transform our lives. It could build a new utopia if we survive the change. <laughs> so how do we make sure we survive the change? What do you want governments and all the other stakeholders, who, many of whom are here in Davos, what do you want them to be doing to prepare society for the change? Yeah, so I've helped put together with the, the assistance of some colleagues something called the Trusted AI Alliance. And it's anchored at Imperial College London, but has a number of other top institutions involved. So we have over 3,500 AI researchers who are all working on this common problem of how do we build responsible and trustworthy AI. And uh, we've, we've further sort of broken that up into three major pillars. The first pillar is AI assurance. So making sure the AI does what it's supposed to and not what it's not supposed to. The second is workforce of the future. What does this new world of work look like? How can we have AI help enhance our productivity? And, and how do we navigate reskilling people if those jobs that they were in become obsolete? And then the, the final pillar is AI for humanity. And so the, the dinner that I'm hosting at Hub Culture uh, Ice House Tuesday night is on this AI for humanity theme, which is, you know, how do we use AI to tackle the UN Sustainable Development Goals? To make the world a better place. To make the world a better place. And in terms of the assurance, you know, a lot yeah. of this AI research is being done by private companies. It's not being done by government run institutions or even in academia. How do you make sure that they are obeying rules, that they are, you know, sort of doing AI for what it's supposed to be and not you know, playing off grid effectively? Who monitors this? Yeah. How do you well, hold them it, to account? It, it, it's not only monitoring, it's even more fundamental. We have to democratize the tools. So the wonderful thing about large language models is we democratized access to AI. You no longer needed to go to some high priesthood of computer scientists to talk to the AI, but you literally could just have a conversation with it. But the back-end systems behind that are concentrated in, you know, five to seven private companies. And so you have essentially five to seven individuals deciding what hundreds of millions and eventually billions of people are going to get to see and do. And so we need more open source AI. Uh, so we need open source code. We need open source data because the AI is useless without the data. The, the way you make the AI do anything interesting is to train it with, with data. And so we need more open source data. And then finally, we need policy. We need government intervention to help regulate this and manage this in, in a way that is not captured by a handful of interests. So I was part of the advisory committee for the EU AI Act. And that was a process where there was a lengthy consultation period. There were a lot of different voices in the room who helped shape that act. It wasn't just a handful of government bureaucrats. Some other countries, and most notably the US, have taken a very different and disturbing approach where you have a very small number of people making the decisions and a very, very small number of private sector and privately funded actors deeply influencing the policy and the executive order that came out this fall. So we need a more open process and open policy. So that's, that's the big push while you're here. Give the tools to people so that they can make the right decisions. And just to, to give people a glimmer of hope, because that's a long process, uh, just tell us about, because you also have a, a private sector interest, tell us about one of the companies you, uh, you invest in, because it just shows where AI might take medicine. Absolutely. This is one so, of the most so, exciting things I've heard. Since yeah, I've been well, here. It, it, it's, it's great stuff. Uh, and, and so I have my, my time as a. Uh, I call it uh, the life of a pracademic. So part of my time is in academia, but part of my time is running my venture studio, Visionary Future. And uh, there I've uh, got a number of companies that are working towards these UN Sustainable Development Goals. So one of them, Dandelion Science, the R&D Center is here in Switzerland. Um, they're using light, patterns of light, that an AI controls in a feedback loop with your brain to help treat serious central nervous system uh, disorders. So uh, it's a field known as neuromodulation. Uh, and it, it's very exciting and deliver much more effective precision medicine uh, to cure serious disease and illness. So Another this is using light yes. rather, than, rather than normal pharmaceuticals, not taking pills. You're That's using right. Light no to systemic toxicity. Everything. It's very focused and targeted, and it can help actually rewire your brain to help, you know, effectively the blind see. That's uh, and so, phenomenal. Yeah, it's very exciting stuff. And then, you know, we, we have other uh, amazing companies as well, like the Emissions Capture Company, excuse me, the Emissions Capture Company, or ECHO, which is using an AI control system to actually uh, modulate the chemical reaction inside a smokestack and, and take the carbon out of the smoke 
and turn it into food-grade baking soda. Uh, so they've been working with companies like Nestle and other major, major fast-moving consumer goods companies with power plants that have these gas-fired you know, smokestacks that are putting carbon in the air. They're taking that carbon out and turning it into something useful uh, that's safe for people to ingest. That's amazing. So you're solving the climate crisis and helping bakers all over the, all over the world. <laughs> baking soda for all. Doing our best. <laughs> So lots of hope there, as well as the, the fears of AI. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Before you go, just yes. tell us about your new book. Yes. So a lot of people are asking me about AI and how do they get smarter about it and, and what do they do about it? Uh, and <laughs> what should their kids study in school? Yes. Among, that's a common question. So uh, I came out with a book uh, from Little Brown and Harvard Business Publishing. Uh, so in uh, the UK and Europe, it's called Basic AI, A Human Guide to Artificial Intelligence. Uh, and it'll be released in the U.S. as Welcome to AI, A Human Guide to Artificial Intelligence. So that is out now. I can't think of a book that's more important right now. So thank you very much for writing. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us here at Hub Culture. David Schreier, I'm Manveen Rana. Thanks for joining us.